Praise the Lord, saints. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. God is so great. God is so good. Hallelujah. We just thank him for his presence today. We thank him for being our father today. We thank him for Jesus and the blood that was shared today. We thank him for the Holy Spirit who comfort and convict us. We just thank the Lord for his goodness. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about God's goodness. Hallelujah. Everywhere I turn, I see him blessing me. Every time I turn, I see his love for me. Every time I turn, I see his grace extended towards me. Every time I turn, I see how he is the one that anoints me. Hallelujah. And he also anoints you. I want you to know today that God can take you further than man can take you. Hallelujah. And we're just so thankful that he loves us today, that he cares about us today, that we can have confidence and trust in him today. Hallelujah. I want you to know that God has given us this mini series uh, as it relates to permanent brook versus temporary brook. Hallelujah. I hope this bless your soul is already blessing my soul as he speaks to me. Hallelujah. About the permanent brook versus the temporary brook. Also, we have, uh, uh, during our Bible study, we have a, a series that's entangled with this called The View. Hallelujah. It's very important that we understand or understand the views uh, in which we see things. Uh, we should be seeing things from God's perspective. Hallelujah. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Numbers. Hallelujah. To the book of Numbers. Hallelujah. 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 The book of Numbers. Numbers chapter number 14. Hallelujah. Numbers 14. This is where we stopped off on Thursday night. I encourage you all to go back and forth uh, reviewing what God has said on Sunday and also reviewing what God has said on Thursday nights because as I said, they are entangled. Uh, together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Numbers <clears throat> chapter 14, verse number four. It says, And they said to one another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land and rent their clothes. And they spake unto all of the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to search it, it is exceedingly good land. And for a few moments, I'd like to talk to you from the subject. Permanent brook versus temporary brook, part two. Permanent brook versus temporary brook, part two. Follow me. Thank you and we bless you. What is a point of time and a point of season. Father God, I deny myself. I pray that the people of God will see all of you and none of me. I pray now, God, that you would speak to our hearts on this day, that you would deliver a word into our spirit, God, that allows us to move higher, to higher heights into deeper depths. I pray now, God, that you would speak to our hearts today, God, I pray that you would encourage us, God, that you would lift us up to that high place that you have called us to be. Father, we thank you today for your grace. We thank you today for your mercy. We thank you today for your peace. Father, I thank you for allowing us to enter into your rest. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Permanent, permanent brook versus temporary brook, part two. Hallelujah. If you don't mind, I need to go back and just recap a few things that we covered on Thursday tonight so we'll be able to move into the things that God wants to say today. Uh, first, we talked about the three levels of, that God shared with me, the three levels of viewing something. We're viewing something from a ground perspective or ground view, viewing something from a mountain view, and also viewing something from a kingdom view. And oftentimes, as people, okay, before you're saved, the only view that you can ever have is a ground view. Hallelujah. Because you don't have the Lord and because you're not connected to the one uh, that has the ability to elevate us, 
uh, everything that you see is from a ground perspective. I want you to know when you're looking at things from a ground perspective, things appear much different from a ground perspective as it does from a mountain view or a kingdom view. Then God oftentimes, if you read throughout the Bible, uh, God takes us to a mountain view or a position of the mountain, uh, on the mountain. Uh, even t God even took Jesus uh, to the mountain. The Bible says that he took mountain, God to the mountaintop, Jesus to the mountaintop to pray. I want you to know that God will often take us to the mountaintop, one, to be alone at times, but often he'll take us to the mountaintop so we can have a different perspective of what we're watching. In the military, we always like to have the higher ground. We feel that if we have the higher ground, we have the advantage because it's hard for the enemy to try to fight uphill, hallelujah, when you're bearing down on them. So we love the high ground. In fact, if we do not have the high ground, sometimes we do not attack because we feel we're not in the best position uh, to win the war. I want you to know that God will take you to the mountaintop or to the mountain view and give you a mountain view uh, uh, so you can see things from a perspective. One thing I like about the mountain view is that uh, just because you, uh, God has elevated you to a mountain view, uh, uh, it does not, it is not equal to a kingdom view. Now, once you have, when once you have reached a kingdom view, it's a place where you look at things like God. It's where you look at things from God's perspective. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 self is out of it. The natural man is out of it. And now you view things the way God views them. Once you have a kingdom view, Hallelujah. Because it's off, it's very you, you very well can ha be have a mountain view, but still have a ground perspective. Mm. See, you can be watching something or viewing something from the mountain, but still thinking like you're on the ground. But I want you to know once you reach the level of kingdom view, then you view things the way God views them. And once you start to view things the way God views them, you're really going to be invincible. Hallelujah. You're going to be spiritually invincible. Because any time that something comes up against you, you will automatically be looking down on it. And not only will you be looking down on it, but you'll be looking at it from the God's perspective or kingdom perspective. Hallelujah. So then, uh, uh, just to recap just a little bit, um, uh, the Lord told Moses uh, to gather 12 leaders. Okay, not just 12 people, not just 12 men, but 12 leaders. Okay, he was going, they were in the, they were, uh, they were in the wilderness. And they were uh, moving from Egypt to where they were slaves to moving to the promised land, Canaan, when God had promised them. And now it's time to go to search or to recon that land. Okay, so God sent twelve leaders to go and spy or to search the land. And so when He sent these twelve leaders, okay, they came back with with three things. They came back with evidence, they came back with a good report, and then they came back with an evil report. Uh, let me say that again. Uh, after 40 days of reconning or searching this land, Canaan, which is the promised land, uh, uh, the, uh, the leaders came back with three things. I would often thought that they came back with two things. I thought I always thought that they came back with evidence and that they came back with a report. But I want you to know that, that they not just came back with a report, but one crew came back with a good report while the others came back with an evil report. So they came back with three things. Um, the, the evidence that they came back with was that they brought back a cluster of grapes that they had got by Eshcol the brook. So down by the brook in the valley, they had came back with these grapes. It was enormous, very, very large grapes to show the children of Israel how plentiful and how great the land was. In fact, these clusters of grapes were so big that they had to put it on a staff or a stick and had to carry them with two men. Uh, it, it was a two-man carry because they were so large. So they come back with evidence of the goodness of Canaan or the promised land that God had promised. Okay. But then also of the 12 leaders, they came back with an evil report and they also came back with a good report. And if you look over and if you turn back for just a little bit, if you turn over to Numbers 13, starting at verse number 27, it goes to show kind of how the conversation went. Okay. 
They came back with these three things, the cluster of grapes, the evil report, and a good report. So now the, the ten leaders, okay, started out by saying in verse 27, I find this very interesting. It says, verse 27, it says, and they told him and said, we came into the land where the thou sent us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So the ten, which brought back the evil report, which I'm going to get to in just a second, started out with a good report. But I want you to know that their evil report, uh, the reason that it's called an evil report is because even though they started out talking about good, they was just getting through the good to get to what they want to talk about. Have you ever been around people before? Uh, they start out with one thing, but the reason they're starting out this way is because they want to go in this direction. Oftentimes, when you get ready to hear some bad news, they may come to you and say, hey, how you doing? Is everything all right? They may come to you in a kind way, but that's just a setup for what I'm about to say. <laughs> uh, 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 even though they, 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 they proved to the people or showed the people or shared with the people uh, uh, that this is a land, yes, surely it's flowing with milk and honey. It's just like God said. Hallelujah. Here is the evidence or here is the fruit of this land. It is surely, it is exactly what God said it is. But this is what I really need to tell you, children of Israel. These are the, these are the ten that had the evil report. Nevertheless, I mean, forget about what I just said. It, said, it acts just like the conjunction, but. Forget what I just told you in verse 27. This is the real reason that I'm talking, or the real reason that I'm speaking. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell there in the north, I mean the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Can Canaanites down by the sea, down by the coast of Jordan. So really... The, the ten brought up the evil report, brought up the goodness of the land so they can get to the evil report. I want you to know that when any time that you bring up evil report, it makes people unrestless, uh, restless. It makes people uneasy. I want you to know that every time that someone brings an evil or you allow someone to bring an evil report in your life, it's going to make you uneasy. Uh, so verse 30 starts out like this. This is not Caleb. And the Bible says, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Caleb seen that in verse 27, when they were, when they was getting ready to start the evil report, they started talking about the goodness of the land. The people were excited. Then he said, then they said, nevertheless, they started talking about all the different inhabitants which were in the land and how the, the wall was great and all of that. So then Caleb seeing that now the people are uneasy. Okay? Love oftentimes we get fidgety when we get bad news. So, so now Caleb had to steal the people or calm the people down right before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Hallelujah. We are well able to overcome it. So he said, based on the evil report that you just got from the 10 leaders, I come to let you know that we are well able to overcome it because we have God. I want you to know that when you have God, you can overcome anything. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus came to overcome the world, and that's what he did. But then verse 31 through verse 33 Okay, they're going back and forth. You got good report, evil report, good report, evil report. So now we're at verse number 31. Here are the men. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Now, what makes a report evil is several things. Okay? One, it goes against 
the word of God. Okay? Uh, anytime what makes one of the aspects of making a report evil is that it goes again. The Bible had already shared that God had already given them this land, but they're telling them, giving them every reason why they can't possess it because of who's there. The, uh, another reason why is an evil report, because most of the time when someone is sharing an evil report, they have a tendency to add more than what they see. Hallelujah. Or intend to add more than what's really present. It says uh, right here that the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. How do they know that? It's made up. And the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Now, remember that God, remember when we're looking at something in ground view, it's actual size when it's in front of you. When you're face to face with somebody, let's say you're standing with somebody and they're seven feet tall. Okay, you're looking up at them because they are seven feet tall. Imagine Shaquille O'Neal in front of you. He's about seven two seven seven one seven two. Let's say he's standing in front of you, and you're looking up at him. He's a big, massive guy when you're on the ground view. But if I take you to a mountaintop and have you to look down at Shaquille O'Neal, he don't nearly look that big when you're watching or looking down on him from the mountain view. I want you to know that God had took these leaders to a mountain view to view what was happening in Canaan, but they're giving a report as if they was on the ground. Mm. I want you to know that just because God elevates you to mountain view, you still, <laughs> you still can operate from a ground view, even though God has elevated you to a position that you should be able to see it from a different perspective. Remember I told you mountain view is different from kingdom view. Kingdom view is when you already had it. Kingdom view is when you already believe like God. You believe what he said. You got confidence in what he said. So anytime something comes up against you, you say things like uh, uh, weapons may form against me, but they shall not prosper. See, people got a kingdom view. Don't care how big it is. Don't care how wide it is. Don't care how hard it is. Don't care how tough it is. They speak from a perspective that I, ca that I am an overcomer. Mm. See, so, so, so they're standing there. And, and, and you got 12 leaders on this mountaintop. You got 10 viewing the situation from a ground view, and you got two that's viewing it from a kingdom view. We got to be careful. We got to be careful of having a ground perspective when we should be operating from mountain or kingdom view. Hallelujah. He said, These men are great statues. Mm. And then in verse then verse 33 says, it goes on to say, and there we saw the giants of the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. How do you know how they view you? See, this is what happens when there's an evil report. You begin to add more and more to the more to the situation. You do not know how they view you. But you're basing on how they view you based on how you view them. I want you to know that your enemy may be enormous, that your enemy may be strong, but I want you to know it's not stronger than he that is in you. Mm. I want you to know that the enemy that you're facing today is not stronger than the strength of God that's on the inside of you. It is greater. Now, your enemy may view you as being weak, kind of like David and Goliath. Goliath thought David was weak because he was because David because David was smaller than Goliath. Goliath thought that he was more powerful. But you got to understand that when you got God on the inside of you, there is not an enemy in front of you that is more powerful than your father that's on the inside of you. Mm. So verse number 14 says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and wept. See, this is what happens when we share an evil report when we should be sharing God's good report. It began to affect people in different ways. 
It says, and the, and the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would we die in the wilderness? And wherefore have the Lord brought unto us this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children be a prey? Whether it not better for us to return to Egypt? Now they're doubting whether they ever should have been released from Egypt. Now they're doubting whether they ever been uh, released as slaves. You realize they've been in bondage for over 400 years in Egypt as slaves. And there was a promise. There was a promise that they was going to be released or freed from Egypt, which means bondage, and delivered unto a land that he had promised them called Canaan. So for years and re years and years and their uh, 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 ancestors had told them, the stories of how they're going to be released. There were people over 400 years during that slavery time in the beginning of it, while they was in Egypt that was believing God for their freedom that never had a chance to walk into it. They were just the ones that bared the word that God had shared. This is the group that had, had the opportunity to partake in what God had promised. They, these, this is the group that was going to benefit from what had been said all of these years. Hmm. So, so now they're starting to worry. Now they're starting to wonder, should we have stayed in Egypt? Should we have stayed in bondage? So this is what they go and do, and this is what we're starting today. It says, for they said to one another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. They have forfeited or want to forfeit everything that God has promised them based on not what they saw. They didn't even go. They weren't even a part of the 12. It was based on what someone said. How often have you given up on your dreams based on what somebody told you? Mm. How often have you given up on what God has promised you based on what somebody said who never even saw the vision that God showed you? You got to realize the vision that God shows you, nobody knows about it. Nobody has seen it except for you and the kingdom. <laughs> Everything in the kingdom. Uh, God has seen it. Jesus has seen it. The Holy Spirit has seen it. The angels have seen it. Nobody over here ready to help you. These, the kingdom is the only people that have seen your vision. And so God gives you a vision and tells you this is what he wants to do in your life. And you cast your pearls among swine and you share your vision with somebody else. And they talk you out of what God said. And they never even saw it. How in the world or why in the world do we allow somebody to talk us out of something that they have never even seen? Mm. I want you to know today that God wants you to move from a place of hearing what the evil report is and believing it, but to, but to continue to believe what God has already said to you, already said to you. Past tense, because if the truth be told, you already have the victory. It's already going to come to pass. God is just going to manifest what is already done created from the foundation of the world. I want you to know whatever God said that he's going to do in your life. Okay, think about the church. God promised the children of Israel that they would be free and that they would walk into Canaan, which is a land, a promised land to them. The reason that it's called promised land because God promised it to them. So think about it, church. The, the land, Canaan itself, the land. Think about the land. Think about the natural land, Canaan, the dirt, the ground, the space, the geography. Think about the land itself. Did God produce Canaan that day? Did He make Canaan that day, or was that land created? From the foundations of the world. God created the earth back in Genesis. He created from the foundations of the world. So when he created the world, remember the Bible talked about how, how he, he formed the dry land with his hands. There was a little spot in that all that land that he created. There was a little spot that was going to be known as Canaan. And from the foundation of the world, he said, there are going to be some slaves in Egypt. My children, the children of Israel, are going to be enslaved, but they're going to get this spot that I'm creating now in Genesis. That spot, that territory, that land, that property, 
that was formed from the foundation of the world, God had already had it set aside. <laughs> it was already set aside for the children of Israel for appointed time. I want you to know that everything that God has promised you has been set aside for an appointed time. It was created from the foundations of the world, but it was set aside for an appointed time. Stop letting people, allowing people to talk you out of something that's already been created for you. See, that's the reason that it's easy for what to be talked out of you is because you don't believe or don't understand or don't know. Maybe it wasn't taught to you that it's already created. So you think that it needs to be created. So when it's not, when you don't see it, the first thing you want to say is, oh, it's God is still, if I don't, you cover these terms, God's still working on stuff. I, I told you, I told you that's not biblical, you know. Uh, to, to say that God is still working on something is to say that God hadn't did it yet. And to say that God hadn't did it yet, okay, is not the faith you need to walk into. That's why it's easy for somebody to talk you out of yourself, because you say God hadn't did it yet. God hadn't did it yet. I'm waiting on God to do it. No, you ain't waiting on God to do it. You're waiting on God to manifest it to you. It's a different terminology, but it affects your faith. If you're still waiting on to do it, then if you don't see it tomorrow, you live from the perspective of he haven't did it yet. And if you haven't lived from the perspective, perspective of he haven't did it yet, it's real easy for the enemy to talk you out of something that's already present, but you don't know it's present. I share with the church, I'm, I'm going to make this development. I'm going to make this development, and I want the name of the street to be Rain Lane. If I believe that Rain Lane isn't done yet, it'd be easy for the enemy to talk me out of it. The fact that I believe that there is a street somewhere in the world called Rain Lane is going to manifest. You can't talk me out of it because I know the street is somewhere. <laughs> Come on now. I'm just trying to make this thing simple. The street is somewhere that was created from the foundation of the world. There's a street that's not named that that's already there. Oh yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe you should I mean, maybe I should put up a, 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 a plot one day. I remember I was going to buy some land one time and I was looking at this plot. And on this plot. There was a bunch of little lots and roads, and it showed roads and the name of the roads and everything was there. But when I got to the land, it was just a field of trees. It was like it was like four, five, six acres of just trees. The road stopped. Okay, the road stopped. I got out the car. When I got out, all I saw was land. But I had a plot in my hand to show the road that went through, that split off. And it was like lots. It was like 40 or 50 lots. Okay? Uh, 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 and, 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 they, and the streets had names. But I'm looking at woods. See, I want you to know that before even the development that you stay in, before they started building the houses and the roads and putting in the water and the sewer and all of that in that street, there was a plot that showed where every house, where every plot, where the road, where the water, where the sewer, where all of that was going to be way before it was manifested. <laughs> it, was, it showed the size of the lot. It showed street names. It showed everything. But I'm sitting here looking at five, six, seven, eight acres of just trees. I want you to know that when God creates something from the foundation of the world, it has plots, it has trees, it has names. Canaan, it was called that. From God's perspective, it was already laid out. It was like a big plot that hadn't been developed yet. I want you to know that God has already developed it in the spiritual realm. It already has a name in the spiritual realm. And what you're going to do is see the manifestation of it. That's one thing I love about when I went away with the military and I would come back to Kannapolis. No, Kalana, I would come back home to see uh, and, and see a new road or a new development. I'm like, oh, they didn't build houses here. They didn't build houses well, from God's perspective, that plot was already created. Mm, I'm trying to get somebody to help somebody out today. That plot was already created from the foundation of the world. The name of your street wasn't created the day that they started paving the road. 
It was all from God's perspective. It was already there. Everybody think that God just made a, a patch of land and just said whatever. No, every road, every street, every gully, every mountain, everything that you see, God had already seen it. He had already done it. So if I would have bought this particular plot of land, the legwork in developing it is already done. It's already got streets. It's already got plots where houses are going. It's the plots had already had addresses. All of this was already on the plot. <clears throat> so I don't even have to go, I wouldn't even have to go and create or develop the neighborhood. All I would have had to do was manifest it. It was already there. When you have a kingdom view, perspective like God, you will be able to see that things are already done. And if it's already done, then you will believe differently. If I would have bought that particular plot, that's probably been about 15, 20 years ago when I was really starting to get into real estate. So when, if I took that plot, bought that land, and took that to the city and says, I want to develop this, you know what the answer would have been? Oh, that's already been done. You see the plot? It's already been done. We got streets, we got names, it's, it's already been done. All you have to do is go and do it. <laughs> they wouldn't use the word manifest because they don't know the word manifest. Manifest. Uh, but but they would have said, oh, you got to just go and do it. It's, it's, it's already done. It's already done. It's already got water, sewers. It's already got manholes. It's already got everything. Uh, you, oh, you just go and do it. No, just, just get your permit and go and do it. No, no, no. I, I want to develop this land. No, no, no. You don't need to develop this land. It, it's, it's already done. It, it's already done. It's, it's look, it's going to be 50 houses here. It's, it's five streets already. It's already done. No, no, no. This is how we sound with God. No, 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 no. I, w I want to do it. I want, I want God to do it. God said, no, no, no. It's, it's already done. I, there's the streets. There, there's the plots. There, there's the houses. Where the houses are going to go. You know, it, it's already done. No, no, God. I, I want you to do it for me. God is. I've already did it. Stop believing that I'm going to do it. Oh, I'm going to mess with somebody's religion. I'm, my brother, my, I'm going to mess right, right now. I'm going to mess with somebody's religion. Stop believing God is going to do it. It's not biblical. Believe that he's already done it and watch him manifest. This is the reason why the word manifest in a sermon we probably hear once a year. Because people are still living from the perspective that God's getting ready to do something. And we're not living from the perspective it's already done. Watch him manifest. Watch him manifest. So they said, let us make us a captain. We don't even know if we're supposed to be here. Uh, we probably need to go back to Egypt, which stands for bondage. So, so basically, verse number five says, And Moses and Aaron fell to their faces in assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Uh, verse Start down to number seven. And it says, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, the land which we pass through to search it. And it it is an exceedingly good land. This is what I want to get to today. It is an exceedingly good land. Now, this is coming from Joshua and Caleb. This is an exceedingly good land. Land. There's two descriptions that they have given as relates to the promised land. I must I want to say Canaan without the name of it. I'm gonna say promised land because I'm talking to you. God has promised you something, so I'm gonna call it the promised land for a little while. It's two descriptions that God has used in numbers as it relates to the promised land. 
He said that it floweth with milk and honey, and it says exceedingly good. It floweth with milk and honey, and it is exceedingly good. What does that mean, Pastor? We don't use words like floweth anymore. We don't, you know, F L O W E T H, floweth. We don't say floweth anymore. We you we've added or used or substituted floweth with flowing I N G. I N G in our language mean continually. I can say I walked over there. That means it's already past tense. Or I'm walking over there, meaning I'm in the presence of doing it. I'm continually to walk right now. Uh, we use I N G. So when God said that this promised land is a land that floweth with milk and honey, He's saying it is a land flowing continually. Mm, flowing continually with what we need and some desires of our heart. What we need and some desires of our heart. Milk is what we need. Honey is what we desire. Uh, uh, it is flowing or floweth milk and, milk and honey. A continual thing. This promised land that God is talking about, when you get to this promised land that God has promised you, Everything that he's promised you is going to flow unto you here. Then right here, Joshua and Caleb refers to it as exceedingly good. Meaning it ain't just good. And it ain't temporarily good. It is a good that's exceeding all the time. There, It is a good that is above just being good and it's good all the time continually. This is what God means by a permanent brook. A permanent brook is where God has led you to a place and it has all of what you need. Oh, It's a place that God leads you to that there are no more wants, there is no more loss as it relates to what God has promised you. Everything that you will need is in this place. It floweth with milk and honey and is exceedingly good. Now, let's talk about exceedingly. It's not just what you need. Let me explain. You know that Mercedes, that car that you got with that Mercedes symbol on the front? Well, for transportation, it didn't have to be a Mercedes. That's exceeding. You know that five-bedroom house that God provides you with, but it's only two of you? <laughs> See, that's exceedingly good. It's, it's, it's more than what you need. Okay? Like, my, my favorite car is a 69 Camaro. I, I don't... I, he blessed me with one. I don't need a 69 Camaro. It, a 69 Camaro isn't even for transportation. It ain't even a work car. It ain't even a car that you take on long trips. It's just a want. <laughs> it's not needed. If I didn't have it at all, as a matter of fact, I'm not even drowning yet because I'm putting it together. If I didn't have it at all, my life would be the same. I would lose nothing. I still be able to get to work. I still be able to get to church. I don't need it at all. It is strictly honey. Mm. Now, 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 my truck is a need. I use it for. Hauling things, I use it to go to work. The, the, the truck is milk. The 69 Camaro is honey. Don't need it at all. <laughs> Matter of fact, if someone come and ask me, why do you need it? I don't have an answer for you. Other than that, I just want it. That's what exceedingly good is. See, when, see the truck is good. But God is better than just good. He's exceedingly good. Back in Genesis, when he formed the land, I don't know if you remember that, when you go back and read Genesis, I love Genesis. When you go back to Genesis, it, when he talked about when he had finished his work, uh, in Genesis, it talked about how he called it very good, not just good. He said, what I created is very good. Now, now it's been
being described here, the promised land, Canaan, the promised land, or whatever your promised land is, God is calling it exceedingly good. It's better than what you need. It has milk, but it has a whole lot of honey. But you got to believe, you got to believe the promise that he made. I remember my dad talked to me about that Camaro when I was like five years old. From the time I was five years old to the time that I was 40, when I possessed it, I, anybody who knows me know I talked about that car for 35 years. 35 years. I talked from a perspective. Didn't even know this. Didn't even know this concept that I'm explaining right now. Didn't even know it. Five, six, seven years old. I did not know to speak those things that be not as though they were. I didn't know that. I just knew I wanted it and I believed that I was going to have it. So I spoke from that perspective and God always honored his word. He always honored faith. See, I had faith in having it. Not even knowing about what exceedingly good is. Not, not even knowing that, that that's above and beyond. To me, it wasn't above and beyond. It was just something I wanted. I want you to know today because I know there's some things that you believe in God for. But don't believe that he's doing it. Believe that he's done it and it's going to be manifested in you. It's going to be manifested in you. This is what you're going to have to be careful of. And I'm going to leave you with this today. Only re Verse number nine. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land. They are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. <laughs> Don't rebel against what God has already promised you. Don't be fearful of the people in the land. Don't be fearful of the things that seem like it's in your way. The Lord is with us. Verse 10. But all of the congregation bade stone, bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto them, Moses, how long will these people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have shown among them? How long? How long are they not going to believe what I've said to them, believe what I've shown them, believe what I've told them? How long? He says, I will smite them with pestilence and will disinherit them. And I will make of thee a great nation and mightier than they. Now, now this part has not happened before, but God showed me this last night over in this morning. Hallelujah. I want to show you this. This is interesting. I've never really paid attention to it before. You and I know that grace came through Jesus. You and I know that grace, the reason that we operate in grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Hallelujah. Grace. God's riches is Christ's expense. You and I know that grace, hallelujah, came through Jesus, meaning, meaning we're getting things that we don't deserve. And things that we do deserve, like punishment, we don't get because grace has stepped in and saved us. Okay, so remember that is grace. God's riches is Christ's expense. That's the acronym for grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. But then also, grace allows me something that I don't deserve, I get. But things I do deserve, like a pun like punishment, the Lord has withheld. Because if, if the truth be told, you and I, and what we have done against God, we should be punished for, but grace steps in. So this is the first time I've known it because I understand that grace comes through Jesus. Hallelujah. Grace came by Jesus Christ. But Moses said something to God in faith and got grace. Woo! Watch this, church. Watch this. This is big. I never really noticed grace in this realm coming through a man asking God. I never really noticed it in the Old Testament. And then it hit me. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians share hearing, because he's ready to smite them all. 
for being disobedient, not believing him. He is ready to smite them all. He says, and Moses said unto the Lord, but then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up these people in thy might from among them. Verse 14. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, and they shall, and they have heard that thou, Lord, art among these people. These people, the inhabitants of the land, already know that God is with us. Okay? Now it's going to seem like you turned against us. Well, not seem like you turned against us, you have. Okay, so he said, Lord, don't do this. He says, uh, um, he said, thou, Lord, art seen face to face and that thou cloud standeth over them and that thou goest before them by daytime in the uh, pillar of the cloud and in the pillar of fire by night. He said, yo, you have done all these miracles for us. Now, if thou shalt kill all these people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, but call the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them. Therefore, he has slain them in the wilderness. People are going to say that you slain us in the wilderness and you was not able to bring us into the land if you do this. And then he says, uh, verse 16, but call the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land which he has sworn to them. Therefore, he slain them in the wilderness. Now and now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering of the great mercy, forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and by no means clearing the guilt, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and the fourth generation. Pardon. I beseech thee, the iniquity of these people according to the greatness of thy mercy. Mm. So, Moses, even before Jesus has shown up, even before Jesus, let me say it like this, before Jesus is manifested, even before Jesus is manifested, why is that important, Pastor? Come on, listen to me. Everything was created from the foundations of the world to include Jesus. Hmm. Brother Mike, do you see where I'm going with this? Everything from the foundations of the world, everything from the foundations of the world was created by the Father to include you, to include Micah, to include Jesus and everything and everybody else. So Jesus hasn't been manifested through the Virgin Mary, but it's been created from the foundation of the world. The Bible tells us, and I wish I had that verse in, in with me, but it talks about how grace came through Jesus Christ. This is in the New Testament. Grace came through Jesus Christ. How can Moses ask for grace when Jesus is not here, he's not present. He's not manifested. Hmm. Already created from the foundation of the world, not manifested yet. Just like the plot, the lines, the line, the lines, the road, the map, the plot, the land, already there, just not manifested. I can see the name of the street. It's no street. It's, it's all woods here. I don't see the streets. I don't see any houses. I don't see any of that. I don't see the stop signs. I don't see the water, any sewer, any manholes. Don't see any of that. But it's already here. Moses stepped into a realm. <laughs> Moses stepped into a realm and pulled grace in. Moses stepped into a realm and pulled something out that nobody had never even seen yet. In fact, in the Old Testament, they referred to it as mercy. <laughs> yes, God extended mercy, but what Moses is asking for is grace. Can, have, have, have you ever, I don't know, I'm from the South, you know, you ain't doing right, you get a whooping. There were times when I was about to get a spanking, and I began to 
plead with my mother about the situation. And there has been a time or two, not many, but there's been a time or two where I didn't get it based on what I said. I deserved the spanking, but reached and asked for grace. Accessed grace, and she extended the mercy. Moses, this, this is how I know it's grace. Moses is asking God to do something that really should not take place. It really should not take place. They deserve what they're getting ready to get. And Moses asked for grace in the Old Testament. Oh, my goodness. He said, the Lord is long-suffering. The, the Lord has great mercy, forgiving iniquity, transgressions, by no means clear, clearing the guilt, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of these people according to the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even unto now. You have forgiven them, Lord, all the way up to here. You have forgiven them all the way from Egypt all the way to now. You have forgiven them. And the Lord said, I have pardoned, according, verse number 20, I have pardoned according to thy word. <laughs> you see that, Micah? I have, this is the Lord talking back to Moses. I have pardoned. Do you know what a pardon is? Let me give to you in the present sense. Somebody goes, to jail, somebody goes to prison for 50 years, and then after 20, they give them a pardon. A pardon means you're released, and the debt has been paid 30 years early. 30 years early. 30 years early. 30 years early, not only just released, because everybody who gets out of prison is not released yet. Some people go on what's called parole. They go on what's called parole, meaning we, we let you out, but you're still under control. Part, that's not a pardon. When you are pardoned, you are released early with nothing hanging over your head. He says, verse 20 says, and the Lord says, I have pardoned according to thy word, or I have graced what you said according to your word. Because you asked. Some of you right now, you need to go to the Lord and ask him for some grace. See, grace is here now. Uh, 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 you need to go and ask him. I, I feel funny in saying grace is here now because it must have been there then because Moses used it. Uh, 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 and, and the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be lifted with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, have tempted me now, then these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Ten times! Ten times you they have disobeyed. Surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto the fathers, neither shall any of them that I provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit. That's what I want to get to. He had another spirit with him and have followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereinto he went and his seed shall possess it. This is what I want to stop today. He says, first, nobody was going in. God was ready to be done with them. Then he says, but my servant Caleb, Caleb, because he had another spirit, church, <laughs> Caleb had another spirit. What do you mean by another? It was not like the other ten. Uh, not only that, he had a spirit that believes me over anything that his natural eyes can see. Mm, this is what I really want to get to. If you want to see the things of God, you're going to have
have to have a spirit that has a kingdom view. That I believe what God says over what my natural eye see, whether I'm at ground level or mountain mountain view. Whether I'm at ground level view or mountain view, I want you to know you're going to have to have another spirit to have the ability or either be elevated up in your spirit to a place where you don't allow those things to affect you. If you allow those things to affect you, it's really no need for God to do it for you. Why do you say that, Pastor? Why do you say there's no need? If you can't believe God to go in, you will never be able to believe him to keep it. Mm. That's why some, some of you, that's why you haven't received what God has for you yet. Or what God has for you haven't been manifested to you yet. You know why? Because God said, even if I take these people in two, who's fearful, who don't believe my word, who does not hearken to my voice, if I take them into a promised land, the men of trouble, the men of trouble, they will give up. The men of trouble, they will give up. We see seeing this today in the news. And the president is getting a lot of flag for it. We have a lot of Americans and some Afghans that helped us during the war, and we're trying to get them out. And everybody's kind of looking at, is the president's fault? And I get where they're coming from. But when we had left that country, we trained, oh, we've been there 20 years. We trained 300,000 Afghan soldiers. 300,000 Afghan soldiers. How to defend themselves. We gave them equipment and everything. The Biden administration and other leaders thought that we would have time to go back and bring people out. Do you know from the time that we left, the Taliban took over, took over our entire country, Afghanistan, in 11 days. You have 300,000 soldiers that had been trained by the U.S. for 20 years, and we left equipment with them. In 11 days, they were overrun. See, it doesn't matter how well you train somebody. It doesn't matter what equipment you give them. If they do not have the heart to defend or to protect what's been given to them, they will get overran. See, the reason that Jesus, God, excuse me, did not want to take these individuals into the promised land, if you can't believe what you see now, you see the Amorites Emer there, you see, you see the Jebusites, you see all of these different enemies or all these different people inhabiting in the land, if you can't believe that you're going to be successful going in, the minute that somebody comes against you while you're in the promised land, you'll give up. And somebody will take what God has given you. It's very important, church, that you believe going in. Because you got to believe going in in order to believe to keep. Ooh. I'm going to tell you right now, you need as much faith to believe that you can go into the promised land you need the same amount of faith to believe that you can keep the promised land. Don't think it's because you go into a place, it's automatically designed for you to keep a place. I want you to know that the enemy is always trying to come against you. So the minute that God gives you something, if you didn't believe in end, it's going to be hard to keep it. God said, there's no need to be taking these people that have been wandering around for 40 years. There's no need for me to take them in. You know why? Because if you can't believe me going in, you'll never be able to believe me to keep it. That's the reason why some people have not received what God has for them. God says, if I give it to you, you ain't gonna, you, 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 you ain't gonna, you, you, you ain't gonna believe. You didn't believe going in. You complained about the inhabitants, how big they were, how mighty they were, the statue, how strong they were, how they view you as grasshopper. If you believe now going in with that attitude and with that mindset and with that faith and lack of courage, when you get in and somebody tried to attack you from the outside, you would say, oh, they're bigger than us. Uh, they're mightier than us. They see us as grasshoppers. They're going to take us over. How do you take over an entire country in 11 days? How do you take over a country in 11 days? I want you to know, people, the same faith that you have going in is going to take that same level of faith, if not greater, to sustain it and to keep it. Hallelujah. God said he has a permanent brook for you. 
He is a permanent brook that's flowing or floweth with milk and honey. And that is exceedingly good. But you're going to have to believe him to receive it. And you're going to have to believe him to keep it. There may be someone here today after hearing this word that God has touched your heart. And today, I want to let you know that if you want to be saved today, it's not a game, it's not a gimmick. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Or well, maybe someone here today after hearing this word, you say, Lord, I want to, I want to, I want to rededicate my life back to him. I, I kind of uh, started doing my own thing and next thing I want to get back in his will, I want to get back in his way. I want you to know, he said, if you return unto me, I shall return unto you. Hallelujah. And maybe someone here today after hearing this word, you say, Lord, I want to be, I want to be a member of this church, pastor. I've been watching this program for a while and I know this is a place that God wants me or would have me to be. If that's you, we welcome you. And last but not least, we want to pray for the people. The Bible says that we all stand in the need of prayer. Hallelujah. We all stand in the need of prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So repeat this prayer of salvation if you want to be saved today. God is willing and able, hallelujah, to save you. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, but I confess and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And rose on the third day with all power in his hand. And because I confess and because I believe, I believe that I'm saved. I'm saved. I am saved. Hallelujah. If you repeat that prayer today and you meant it from the bottom of your heart, God has saved you. And now you've just entered into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. It may be someone here today after hearing this word. You know, going over and rededicate my life. Repeat after me. Dear Lord, forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. I promise, Lord, this time it'll be much better than before. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer today, God, just reunite with you. He said, return unto me, and I shall return unto you. Hallelujah. If you want to be a part of this ministry, reach out to us at Greater Mission Ministries Church at gmail.com. Greater Mission Ministries Church at gmail.com. Or my personal email at Pastor Michael T. Weeks, W E A K S, Pastor Michael T. Weeks at gmail.com. If you want to reach out to you, tell us what God has done in your life. Let us know that he saved you or rededicated your life, and we want to get some ministry gifts out to you. We want to get some communion out to you so you can be with us on first Sunday, and also we want to give you a ministry gift. So just reach out to us at Greater Mission Ministries Church at gmail.com or Pastor Michael T. Weeks at gmail.com. Hallelujah. Let me now pray for the people. Hallelujah. And then pray for the offering, the offering first. Father, we thank you now. For giving us the ability to give. We don't count the debt we owe, but seeds that we sow into your kingdom. Father, take this gift, take this glory, use it for your season, God. Father, we thank you right now for your goodness. We thank you now for your mercy. We thank you how you have blessed us and how you have kept us, God. We thank you, God, from the bottom of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Now, let me pray for the people. First of all, I want to thank you for being a part of the service today, a part of the broadcast. I pray that there was a word today that blessed your heart. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now for the people. Hallelujah. We lift you up because you are worthy. But we thank you today for the people, God, that has sat with us, God, and fellowshiped with us and, and communed with you through this broadcast. Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would touch them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, that you allow them not to lack for anything, God. I pray that the promises, God, that you have placed in their life, God, be manifested, God. Father, I thank you for creating them from the foundation of the world. But Father God, we thank you for the manifestation of these blessings. Father, give them enough faith. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Allow them to have enough faith, God, to believe going in. And let them have enough faith to sustain what you have given them. Father, we just thank you right now. Satan, sir, we know that you have no authority. You are defeated foe, and the blood of Jesus is against you. God, I can't begin to praise the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Until next time, we thank you for being a part of our service 
want you to know that God loves you and so do we. Be blessed in the name of the Lord.